Hello, today on my channel you will hear an amazing story about life. I hope you enjoy this story. This one struck me to the core. Honestly, I still can't forget it. Enjoy watching. The new Mazda CX-9 was racing merrily along the highway. From the speakers came club music passing drivers looked enviously at Jack driving the Japanese, near which sat the beautiful Leslie. Billy sat comfortably in the back. The golden youths were speeding south of Washington to the small village of Landers, which could not be found on a map. These boys had been lucky from birth. They were lucky enough to be born into elite families. Jack was the son of a famous oligarch. Leslie was the daughter of a diplomat who had recently returned from Stockholm. And Billy's father was a pop star. They were all rich, accustomed to luxury. A brilliant future awaited them. The parents were family friends. The children also became friends with each other and even went to school together after graduating from which they were guaranteed a brilliant career. Contrary to the established opinion about majors, the guys behaved culturally and simply did not bore anyone and tried not to break traffic rules. At least, they didn't participate in street racing, didn't use drugs, and didn't commit crimes on camera. Jack, how much farther is it? Billy stared out the window impatiently. It's about 30 kilometers. We'll be there in about 10 minutes. Jack promised. What are you doing? You want to go to the bathroom? No, I just need a smoke. And you got a new car. It's kind of embarrassing. And in front of Leslie. Leslie doesn't smoke. Jack looked at the girl with furtive affection. She was staring at her iPhone, unable to see or hear anything. Open the window, have a smoke. The owner of the car allowed it. It's no big deal. Right, Leslie? Leslie didn't answer, leafing through the tape. Jack pressed a button and the glass beside Billy obediently slid down. Billy took out his cigarette case, pulled out a cigarette and flicked the lighter. Leslie, Jack called out. The girl paid no attention to him. Then Jack took the iPhone from her with one hand and slipped it into his inside pocket. The girl was startled. What are you doing? Get it back. I'll get it back when we get home. Jack replied, turning the steering wheel to the right. And now, no cell phones. No iPhones, no TVs, nature, countryside, and clean air. Yay. Fool. Leslie got mad and turned away to the window. Don't be angry, said Jack. Sometimes it's good to get some fresh air and relax. We'll buy some real GMO-free food from the locals, cook a kebab, drink some real milk, breathe the fresh country air. We'll swim in the river. At least we'll get a glimpse of the real USA. There's one thing I can't figure out. Are our ancestors patriots? We're in our third year, and we could have gone to Oxford or Harvard. I asked my father, and he said it was decided. Who decided? Billy said thoughtfully. Oh, Billy, it's not a matter of patriotism, replied Jack. First of all, we are close to our ancestors under their control. Secondly, it's a long story, but now the president is pursuing such an internal policy that it's amazing. I'll tell you all about it when we get there. If you want. Sure I do. Billy got excited. Soon the car pulled into Landers and stopped in front of the last house. The boys got out of the car and began to look at Jack's purchase. Yeah, Jack. You're not good at real estate. Billy sighed. Leslie remained silent as she looked at the dilapidated structure. The house was really unassuming. It might have been a nice place to live in a backwoods village of three yards and two stakes, but now it was a dilapidated barn of rotting boards. I bought it for nothing, almost for nothing. Jack bragged, only $500, but look at the lot. Here we can easily rebuild everything, improve, and we'll have a great summer cottage. We'll be able to come and hang out here and our parents won't find us. They'll never even think to look for us in the middle of nowhere. Leslie just imagined right here, Jack pointed to the backyard. That's where the flowers will grow. And here's a picnic area with a barbecue and everything. And there I'll dig a pool, next to the summer shower a bungalow for changing clothes, sunbeds, tables, and we'll rebuild the house, of course. We have enough money. You're right. After a short thought, Billy said. Sure. How much is real estate worth in Washington now? That's a hell of a lot. And here's a plot of land with a shanty town house for a pittance and rebuild it all. Well, it's still a lot cheaper. Also, there's a cellar. I'll make a wine cellar there. You'll make your own wine? The girl said wryly. No. I'll buy different bottles and we'll have a bar there. I'll cash, Leslie said mockingly. I'm not even going to be one. Jack parried, 
but you'll come and visit me here. And I'll treat you to 300-year-old wine. Will you like it? I like it. The girl agreed. Then she smiled wryly. You're still an alcoholic. Of you. Jack was offended. Leslie walked forward, looking at the lot. Billy put his arm around her shoulders and they followed. After surveying the grounds, the friends entered the house. Yeah, it was a shack. Billy looked around and sighed. Yeah, for now. John agreed and shrugged his shoulders. But soon it'll be like a Roger's palace. I'll take your word for it. Leslie said, but I'm going to sleep in the car. I don't want to feed the bent bugs and spiders in this stench. We'll all sleep in the car. In the meantime, let's buy some food from the locals. Jack suggested it. Who's selling what here? Leslie wrinkled her nose squeamishly. Let's ask the locals, said Billy. Look, we were just passing the store. Let's ask around. Jack suggested it. Let's do it. Billy agreed. Should we drive or walk? Let's do it this way. Leslie and I'll take off. You stay here. Keep an eye on the car, Jack suggested. Ah, uh, no, the girl protested. I just bought these sneakers yesterday. I'm not going to run them off the village roads. Jack waved his hands. His secret idea of being alone with Leslie had broken down like a ship on a reef. Well, let's go then, he said. Jack, I'm really going to stay here, said Billy. I'll look around and see what it's like. Whatever you want, man. Valik was ready to kiss his buddy. The car pulled away. Billy stood there for a moment, looking at his friends, and went into the hut. Jack and Leslie were gone more than an hour. When they came back, they saw that Billy had cleaned up the house and started on the yard. You're good, Jack marveled. He did. Billy swept the garbage away from the house, removed the branches, swept the house, removed the centuries-old cobwebs from the corners, and found an empty samovar and rubbed it with a rag. There was nothing to do anyway, he said embarrassedly. Leave it alone, Jack advised him. You'll have to wash it with sand or baking soda, then boil it in citric acid. How you know so much about farming? Leslie marveled. You know, I was often sent to my grandmother's house by my ancestors. She lived in a private house, so she did not recognize luxury. She was religious. I learned a lot from her, Jack said. That's great, Leslie marveled. So what's up? Who's been threatening you with a kebab? I'm starving. And I've already built a grill. I got the wood. Billy bragged. Well, you're on the barbecue. Leslie and I will do the rest, said Jack. Then we'll have to wait a couple hours. I'll build a fire and marinate the meat. Just while the heat's building, the meat will marinate. You guys get the rest of the stuff ready, said Billy. The young men ate shish kebab and potatoes baked in the fire in an hour. Having eaten enough and drunk wine, they brewed coffee in a pot. You promised to tell me what's going on in politics, why we can't study abroad. Billy reminded me. Look, the whole fifth column studied abroad. Jack started it. Well, so what? That doesn't mean we're gonna support it, Billy countered. Unfortunately, it does, said Jack. You see, there's information that our people are being recruited. Threats, blackmail. Some of them are just bought, but you either come back and vote against the first, or you don't come back at all, and they start blackmailing your ancestors like you're a hostage. I don't know about yours, but mine's being squeezed. All his savings are in Zurich. That's how they're strangling him. That's why we're sitting in the US, the purge has begun. Well, I'm not good at politics, and I don't want to get into that topic, but I agree that the US is better off without those, and home is still better. Anyway, I don't see my dad much. He's always on tour. My mom too. It's fine. Leslie said, our education is no worse than theirs. My mom told me that in the Soviet era, people came to us from abroad to study. That was in Soviet times, Jack sighed, but now it's become prestigious to study in the middle of nowhere. I, for example, don't like foreign languages, although I speak English fluently, but I don't want to be taught in that bare language. It doesn't work. That thing ate him. We gotta get out of here. It looked like Leslie was getting hysterical. John walked over to her and put his arm around her shoulders. He quietly touched his lips to her neck. Calm down, he said softly. We'll leave now. Only, what will we tell his parents? I don't know. The girl's shoulders shook and she burst into sobs. Let's go. We'll figure something out on the way. John took her hand and led her to the door. As he pushed it open, he realized with horror that the door was locked shut by an invisible force. 
John swore foully again. What? What's wrong? Leslie worried through her tears. It's locked. The boy answered glumly. Then he went back, found an axe and began to chop the door to pieces with it. But it was like a hex. Not a single blow did any good. That was it. Leslie sank to the floor in doom. I realize we're prisoners of this house and this freak. We're just food for this monster. Food, you know, Jack. We're just food. Jack sat down on the floor next to the girl and she pressed her whole body against him. Jack felt her shivering and realized it wasn't from the cold. Leslie was scared out of her mind hysterical. Don't be afraid, he said affectionately, putting his arm around her shoulders. I won't let it eat us. He'll choke. What are we going to do? The girl sobbed. You know, my father says as long as we're alive, we can fix things. What did they use to kill werewolves? Like vampires with a silver bullet or an aspen stake right? We don't have bullets, guns, or aspen stakes, Leslie objected. Well, for weapons, we have an axe, said Jack. What's the use? He couldn't even cut through a decrepit, worthless door. Let's try the window. Jack got up, took the axe and began to smash the window. The panes fell right off, but the shutters were like iron. Why do we make a deal with him? Leslie suggested. Yeah, John quipped. This food often agree with you not to eat it. What was his name? Do you remember? Archie, I don't remember exactly. Name's good enough. Let's give it a try. We'll see what happens. Well, at least there's a chance. John agreed, you know, he said. If I'm here, like Billy, anyway. You remember I loved you. Leslie suddenly grabbed him sharply by the neck, pulled him to her and kissed him greedily on the lips. He kissed her back. The kiss could have lasted a long time, but a new howl and moan mixed with a growl, came from the cellar. The young men tore themselves away from each other and looked at each other. There he was again. John said with annoyance, Look, are you going to calm down today or not? You're a pain in the ass. The blow to the cellar door from below was much stronger this time than the last. John clutched the axe that lay beside him. Can you see the stove? He asked quietly. Get in there. Leslie nodded and climbed up on the stove. Oh, Jack, Give me a light, she asked. John silently walked over and handed her her iPhone. The girl turned on the flashlight and pulled out an object. What is it? John asked. Some kind of wooden carrot, replied the girl. What? The boy couldn't believe his ears. A steak? Give it to me. He took the object and examined it carefully. It was indeed a steak. Long, about 50 centimeters, pointed at the bottom. It gave some hope. It might be aspen he said thoughtfully. Too bad I'm not a carpenter and don't know about trees. But it's a weapon too. Hide, he commanded the girl. Leslie pressed herself against the back wall and a new rumble broke the silence. The cellar lid flew out like a champagne cork and on the wooden floor lay two huge furry paws. John put the stake in the waistband of his jeans and gripped the handle of the ax tightly. Come here, bitch, he growled. A vicious snarl came in response and a huge beast leaped out of the cellar, pawing at the floor. It stood on hind legs that looked like those of a huge dog. Its torso resembled that of a bear, and there was something of bear and wolf on its muzzle. The beast was over two meters tall. From under the low forehead among the thick fur two predatory eyes shone bright red lights in fierce anger. But the most frightening thing about him was his mouth. Huge fangs, resembling daggers, rows of crooked sharp teeth inspired fear. The beast reeked of rot. It growled and stood on four legs, looking around for its prey. John tucked his cell phone into the inside pocket of his jacket and tossed it onto the stove with one hand, then squeezed the handle of the axe again until it hurt. Fear left him, and instead of fear there was a kind of fighting spirit in his head. Well, scum, this is for Ben. Jack leaped forward, chopping the air with his axe. The axe struck the beast's low forehead with a thud. It roared and shook its head violently. John, who hadn't had time to pull the axe out, broke away from the handle and flew back against the wall. He hit the wall with his whole body and slid down. The werewolf pulled the axe from his head and tossed it aside. Then growling, began to approach John. At that moment, Leslie, who had been watching the fight from the darkness, screamed in terror. The beast turned sharply toward the stove and growling, stood on its hind legs. Taking a step toward the stove, it stretched its neck and let out a loud growl. At that moment, John rolled over to where the axe lay and fumbled for it in the darkness. 
The shape of the beast was faintly visible, but it was enough to jump up and strike the werewolf with all his might. It turned around, homing its paw to grab the guy, but Jack jumped back, still clutching the axe. A small, barely perceptible ray of moonlight shone through the slit between the shutters. It was a little brighter. The werewolf turned its whole body toward the boy and growled. John jumped forward, threw out his axe hand and struck the werewolf in the leg. The axe did no good, but only made the monster angrier. With a kick of his leg, the werewolf threw Jack back against the wall. Then it came up, grabbed him by the shirt, and yanked him forward. The shirt ripped in half, leaving the boy stripped to his waist. Jack bounced to the side and got into a stance. There was a reason, oh, there was a reason he'd gone to karate school. Come here, Archie, he said. The monster spread its front legs and on its hind legs, growling loudly, went at its prey. John backed away slightly, remembering that there was a cellar cave nearby. The silver cross around the boy's neck was caught by a moonbeam that stubbornly came through the gap between the shutters and reflected the light into the werewolf's chest. It smelled like scorched wool, and the beast let out a roar, then a howl, and clutched at its chest with its paw, where a thin stream of smoke was drifting out. John jumped and kicked the werewolf in the chest with both feet. It didn't help, the boy only flew away from the beast like a wall. The werewolf clenched its fangs and grinned and struck him with its paw. John barely had time to bounce when the terrible paw swept the centimeter past him. Meanwhile, the beast's fur continued to burn, burning more and more areas. Soon the werewolf could no longer handle the fire. He fell to the wooden floor and began beating his chest with his paws. But stinking smoke soon billowed from his mouth and ears. That gave the lad time to find the stake and axe that had long since fallen out of his belt. Climbing onto the burning beast, he stuck the stake into its chest and hammered it with the axe like a nail. The horrible death howl of the stricken beast stunned the boy, who instantly flew off the furry torso. The werewolf tried to get up, but he had no more strength. The boardwalk cracked under the impact of the collapsed carcass and the werewolf froze. John wiped the sweat from his forehead and looked away. Well, we've beaten the beast and we'll beat this one. We should check out the cellar. John moved towards the opening, where he tried not to fall through during the fight. Maybe we shouldn't. Leslie grabbed his forearm, trying to stop him. We have to. What if there's a way out? Stay here. John took his jacket put it on, and took his cell phone out of his pocket. The light of the flashlight illuminated the room and the cellar steps. The boy carefully began to climb down, lighting his way. Soon he disappeared into the darkness. Leslie, come down here, he shouted. The girl started downstairs when she heard John's voice. What a surprise. Who do I see? When the girl came down, she saw Jack hubbing a completely alive and unharmed. Billy. Alive. Leslie shrieked with joy and rushed over to the boy. When it grabbed me, I didn't even realize it. I hit my head hard on the step. Then I got scared. Anyway, I was lying there unconscious, Dan told me. Wait, I heard a crunch. The beast was chewing something. Wasn't it you? John was surprised. Well, as you can see, no. Billy smiled. There's a lot of big rats around here. Maybe I ate one. What about you? How did you escape? Oh, Billy, Leslie said with admiration. Jack reminded me of a hero from the fairy tales. You fought the beast so well. And I fainted too. I was scared. Where's the monster? Billy asked. Upstairs. Dead. So I broke the curse and killed him. Everybody laughed. Anyway, seriously, we can't get out of here. It's all boarded up. Leslie reported. That's too bad. What if the two of us pile in? Billy suggested. John shrugged. Let's give it a try. They climbed out of the cellar. Jack went straight to the door, and Billy looked at the dead monster with interest. Oh, you were good, he marveled. Come here, John called out. Billy walked over, looked at the door, and pushed it open. And the door, C-R-E-A-H-E-D-O-P-E-N. Wonderful, John said. I've beaten it with an axe, kicked it with my feet, and nothing. You just pushed it open. Well, just like that, said Billy. That's it. Let's get out of here. Leslie, John looked around. I'm right here. The girl was the first to leave the house. The guys rushed after her, got into the car, and in two minutes they were racing away from the village. What do you plan to do with this purchase? The girl asked. Well, the beast is gone. John shrugged, 
looking at the road. And I'm used to finishing what I've started. So we'll still have a summer house. What do you think, Dan? It's a good idea, Billy agreed. Jack and his girlfriend, who were looking at the road, didn't notice how Billy unbuttoned his tracksuit jacket and scratched his brown hairy chest. John picked Leslie up, has agreed, at six sharp. The girl came out of the driveway, smiled and waved to him. Jack jumped out of the car and gallantly opened the door for her. Leslie got into the car, the guy carefully closed the door. Then he got behind the wheel. So what's the program of the first date? Leslie asked cheerfully. And you know, let's, as our parents started. Jack suggested, movies, ice cream. Yeah, innocent kisses on the bench. That's what the girl said. Oh no, let's go modern. A club? John grimaced. Why the club? Show some ingenuity, come up with something original. At that moment, the guy's cell phone rang. Jack pulled the receiver out of his pocket, looked at the display and pressed the answer button. Hello. Yes, it's me. Who's this? Oh, hello. What? How did you disappear? No car. Did you go somewhere else? No, I don't know. Did you call him? Did he leave his phone at home? Yeah, I got it. I'll be right there. So much for the program. Jack turned to Leslie and put the phone in his pocket. The fine Billy quest. What do you think? What do you mean? Leslie was surprised. Dan's missing. The boy explained, turning the wheel. We're going to his house now. His mother's freaking out. Victoria, Billy's mother, was as pale as chalk. She led the boys into the living room and sat them in chairs. We're back from the tour, she said, and he's gone. His things, his money and his car are gone. Wait a minute. We talked to Dan the day before yesterday. He didn't say you wanted to go anywhere, said John. That's weird, said Leslie. Did you call the police? I did. I called a general I know right away. He said he help. They're going to run the license plate. John's confident. They'll find it. You think so? There was hope in the woman's eyes. Of course, said John. Where will it go? Of course he will, assured Leslie. It's not like aliens stole it. The police will find it. John, are you sure he didn't say anything to you? Victoria looked inquisitively into Jack's eyes. He held her gaze and answered, I swear nothing. I believe you. The woman said in a steady voice, Victoria, when the police find the car, you call me. I'll go there right away, John promised. At that moment, the house phone rang. Victoria went to the receiver and picked up the receiver. Yes. Me, did you find it? Where? Where? What's she doing there? It's strange. There was a long explanation on the other end of the line. Then the woman hung up and went back into the living room. That's strange. Billy's car was seen last night. He was driving somewhere west of town. Jack and Leslie looked at each other. There was only one point in that direction where their companion could be headed. We'll go, Jack said. If you hear anything else, call me. I'll go that way. I'll look for him. I don't want to keep you busy, the woman began. It's nothing. The guy waved her off. Dan is my friend, and if something happened to him, I should help him. I'm sure he'd do the same. With these words, John and Leslie left the apartment. Landers, the girl asked. It is, native. Jack gritted his teeth. What does he want there? I have no idea. The girl shrugged. It's not a village, it's like Side Hill, the boy muttered. Anyway, that's it. I'm going that way. I'll drop you home on the way. Oh no, you won't. I'm coming with you. Leslie was determined. Only this time, we'll bring a flashlight. Then I'll stop by the house and pick up a few things. Let's go. As Jack's car spit into Landers, it was night. Jack pulled up in front of the house where he and his friends had had a terrible experience. He turned off the engine, got out and looked around. There was no sign of Billy's car. Apparently, he hadn't even come here. Oh shit, John turned to the girl. He hadn't been here. So where is he? Leslie shook her head fearfully. I wish I knew. Eh, I wish I could find that grandmother. Maybe she would clarify something. So let's ask the locals, Leslie suggested. What locals? Have you seen the time? It's half past twelve. The drunks are asleep by now. Anyway business. Jack sat sideways against the steering wheel and thought. I'll tell you what, said the guy, pulling out his smartphone. I've got an app. If only the cellular internet here would catch. It should. 
said the girl. I saw a tower on the road. Yes, Leslie, I've got 4G. John rejoiced. And now, satellite, lowering. Here, the recording from last night. And there's his car. So he's past Lander's end. Well, yes. But why did he go into the woods? I can't see now, Leslie said disappointed. Let's go. Let's go. John turned to face the steering wheel and pressed the ignition button. Leslie obediently sat down beside him. The car drove quickly out of the village. John drove onto a wide path and a whole wall of large trees and bushes appeared in front of the car. It's creepy out here, Leslie shrugged, because it's quiet and dark. The guy answered, turning off the engine and keeping the headlights on. They got out of the car. John took a huge flashlight out of the trunk and started shining it around. There was a wall of trees on the left, a wall of trees and bushes in front, and a huge hillock covered with branches on the right. Outwardly it looked like a large den. John walked closer to it, pulled back a couple of branches, and under them was the black hulk of a Porsche Cayenne. There goes Billy's car, he said with relief. Now we have to find the owner. The girl answered and put her hands together and raised them to her lips. Billy, Dan? Branches crunched ahead. John instantly pointed his flashlight there, amplifying the light of his Mazda's headlights, but there was no one there. Don, John shouted. It's us, John and Leslie. Don't be stupid, come out. Silence in reply. Look, Leslie, the boy said, turning, and then stopped, startled. Instead of the girl in front of him stood his friend Billy. Shit, why are you so frightening? The guy was indignant. Leslie, where? I'm here. Her voice came from behind the car. Jack shined his light there. Leslie came closer. Billy, what the hell is going on? Your mom went crazy in there. What are you doing here? How did you find me? Billy asked. By satellite, answered John. So what are you doing here? I'll explain. Just get Leslie in the car, and you're coming with me. Oh, okay. Sweetie, stay in the car. I'll be right back, and I'll go with you. The girl declared, but Billy interrupted her. Leslie, I asked you to. Can't you just sit in the car for five minutes? Assholes, Leslie said, turned around and got in the car. The guy struggled through the dark bushes, walked a few steps. So what's the matter? John asked. Billy tiptoed up, peering behind his friend's back. Is he in the car? He asked, because she's so. Dan, what's with the mystery? What's going on? Okay, I lied to you. I didn't want to scare you. When it grabbed me in the house, I didn't pass out because I hit my head on the stairs. Anyway, the beast bit me. And on the way back, I saw that I was transforming. Look. Billy took off his jacket and stripped naked. Then he began to stretch, his face began to change. In a minute, John was standing in front of a real werewolf, only a little smaller in size than the one he had killed in the house. Then the werewolf began to change back, and soon it was Billy again. The boy dressed quickly and looked at his day's friend. He froze with his eyes bulging. Hey, Dan called out to him. You okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Just, just, shocked, huh? Imagine my shock when I realize I'm an animal now. What's it gonna be? What do I tell your mom? I don't know. Dan sat down in despair and covered his face with his palms. John soon realized he was crying. Come on, buddy. Come on. Come on. Stop it. He sat down beside him and put his arm around his friend's shoulders. Dan pulled his hands away from his face. Yeah, I'm a werewolf now. And you have two choices. Either get the hell out of here or me, like the one in the house. Oh, okay. Uh, hold on. Why'd you run off into the woods? You've learned how to take on the form of an animal and come back. Yeah, but it won't last long. Soon the werewolf essence will push mine out completely. And then, no, I'd rather be in the woods, so I left. Aren't you afraid someone else will find you? Your mother's got the cops all over the place, a general or something. Uncle Mickey, he can do it. He's got all the police in the region at his fingertips, but they won't find me. So what's it gonna be? Kill or leave? Kill? What am I, Van Helsing? Werewolf hunter? Dan, you're not a werewolf, you're normal. You're my friend. You're my best friend. How do I kill you, dummy? Then run. Billy said, I'm determined. I won't. John said, thought you what? 
You want to stay in the woods, you stay in the woods for now. Don't go anywhere. Not even to the village. I'll see if I can find a way to help you out. Bro, there's always a way out. And I'll find it. But what am I gonna tell your folks? And Leslie? Think of something. You can tell Leslie the truth. It'll be easier on both of us. And your folks, I'll give them a note. Okay. I'll tell them I didn't find you. That's it. That's right, too. After a short thought, Dan replied. Well, I'll be going. Jack got up from the bench and looked at his friend. Don't see him off. Dig a dugout. There's plenty of food in the woods. Don't go out to the people. Don't scare the village. And this. Try not to eat raw meat and blood. Otherwise you'll become a real beast. I'll be back soon, as soon as I find a way out. That's comforting, said Billy. So long. They shook hands and John walked back to the car. Leslie was sitting in her seat, locked from the inside, staring at her phone. She's probably more relaxed that way. John decided, knocking on the window. The girl unlocked the doors, and the guy got behind the wheel. Are you going to tell me? Asked the girl. On the way, replied John, driving out of the woods. The Mazda pulled off to the highway and sped off into the night. He'll be back, he will. Billy thought as he watched the foreign car drive away. Harry, Harry, Harry. The persistent woman began pounding on the windows of the precinct house. Harry, sighing, put down his glass, drank the vodka, put a pickle in his mouth, and crunching it, got up and looked out into the hay. Well, why are you making so much noise? In front of him stood a burly country woman, wearing an old coat hastily thrown over her shoulders. Oh Harry, there's a thing, I can't tell you. The walkers were mauled by wolves in the house. Barry got out before they tore him up in the yard, and Selena was eaten right in the house. Lord have mercy. The woman began to baptize. A wolf, you say? Come on you, you'll be baptized in the temple. Let's go and see. Putting on his cap, the policeman hurried to the walker house. Angelica almost ran after him and wailed. Oh, for God's sake, what's going on? The beast is already in the houses. Shut up, for God's sake, it's sickening without you. The policeman stopped abruptly and looked at the stupid woman. She shut up, crossed herself fearfully, and hurried after the policeman again. Near the yard of the walker's house, the policeman stopped, turned to Lena again. Did you find the corpses? Aya? Angelica wiped her wet eyes. I went to Barry's this morning to have him fix my shed. The roof was cracked, and I see Barry lying on the ground dead. I thought he was drunk, but there was blood. All torn up. I called out to Selena, and she didn't say a word. So I ran to you. Wait a minute. So you saw Selena's dead body? No, the woman shook her head. I didn't go into their house. I saw Barry, and I ran to you. You stupid woman. Spit on the policeman, and you say two dead bodies. Galia is probably dead in the house. I've seen in the movies, they say you cannot trample traces. She saw it in the movie. Well, let's go and see. Two hours later, a task force was already at Barry Walker's house. Contrary to Harry's opinion that Angelica was a fool, the woman was right. Selena's corpse was in the house. The unfortunate woman was lying in an unnatural pose, her disfigured face a look of animalistic horror. Not a pretty sight stated forensic expert Mickey Feldman, a short, skinny, middle-aged man with glasses. Well, let's get started. Go ahead. Major Stone responded. I'm going to the yard. Another expert, Feldman's friend and colleague Edward, was working in the yard. Looking at both of them, one could mistakenly think that both experts were twins, they looked so much alike. What do you say, Edward? The investigator turned to him. So far, only one death is terrible but this is not relevant to the case. The expert sighed and adjusted his thin rimmed glasses. In the meantime, I'll work to get some results. Stone sighed and looked behind the wicket. There his assistant, Barbara Sirocco, was interviewing the witness who had found Barry Walker's corpse. Stone walked toward them. So, so, I went like this. The witness stepped to the gate. I see Barry lying there. I thought he was drunk. I was surprised. Barry's a hard worker, not a drinker. Did you touch the body? Did Barbara ask? No, 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 no. I was scared. I crossed myself and ran to the police station. God, what a good man you was, Barry. God rest his soul. 
The witness sobbed and wiped her eyes with her handkerchief. Did the neighbors hear anything? Stone asked. Nothing. Barbara slammed the file shut. They were drunk. And you're the investigator, are you? Angelica looked at Stone with interest. Major Stone. Investigator. He introduced himself. That's what, come right investigator. Angelica took him under the elbow and took him aside. There's trouble here. A werewolf is at work, she whispered. A werewolf. Stone was surprised. That's the one. He'd been eating chickens before, then a cow. Ask her, she'll confirm it. And now he's turned to humans. We need hunters. He lives in the woods. He howls sometimes, it's terrible. And during the day he looks like a young man. Our people saw him. A handsome boy. Angelica shook her head. Good, I got it. Where's the precinct officer? What's his name? Harry. That's Angelica. Thank you, Angelica, you're free to go. Barbara, see if you can get a uniformed officer to come over here. Harry appeared in front of Stone like the devil out of a box. Lieutenant Harry, the precinct officer breathed a breath of booze on Stone. The investigator looked at him squeamishly. Not a cop, a country drunk. Let's get out of here, he suggested. They stepped aside. Drinking on the job. Stone asked suddenly. I'm not. Harry was confused. Look at you, you alcoholic. What kind of cop are you? Your uniform's dirty, you're unshaven, your tunic's missing a button. Your caps ask you, and you've got a little booze on you. You got the signal. Two dead bodies. So. So the first one came running. I made sure no one came in. To make sure there were no footprints. You should have interviewed witnesses, neighbors. Who saw what, heard what. Maybe some of them would have told you more than us. My bad. The policeman said confusedly. Come on. The major waved his hand. Tell me, Harry, what's going on with your farm? People say there's a werewolf eating chickens. A what? A werewolf. The policeman shook his head incredulously. Women's gossip, honestly. Are you sure? Come on, what werewolf? Village scare stories. I'll tell you what. Stone said again. Go to bed. Sleep it off. Clean yourself up. If I see you like this again, I won't write a report to the general. I'll beat you up in public for dishonoring the organs. Got it? Go on. So this, the policeman clapped his eyes. Run. The investigator bellowed. Why did you do that, Harvey? Barbara asked, looking after Harry as he walked away. You're getting a lot of attitude, said Stone. Well, yes, of course, there's hardly any work here. There's nothing for a policeman to do. So he gets drunk. Bored. Not bored. Barbara objected. Loneliness. Angelique told me. He's lonely, a beggar. He wants to get married, but he's had no luck, no matter how many times he tries. He should drink less and wash more often, said the investigator. Fuck him. What do we got? I'm going to go to forensics. Why don't you stay in the car? It's cold in here, and you don't need to see this. Here, take a look at the neighbor's statements. See what you can find. Harvey, did Angelica tell you about the werewolf too? Barbara asked. Stone grinned and shrugged. Well, yes, there are rumors, but we rely on facts. Just the facts. We'll talk about werewolves and other horror stories after work. He opened the gate and entered the yard, where both experts were already smoking and summarizing the results. And what should he make noise when they stabbed him with an aspen stake? Smirked the district officer. No one managed. All devoured. But the kid managed. We have heroic young people. You know, Angelica, he continued, Again pouring vodka into a glass. You're alone, and I'm alone too. Why don't we get together? I like you, even though you're a stupid woman. Oh, you say that too, Harry? You're a drunkard and a lazy slob. Angelica answered playfully. Well, maybe that's why I drink. Loneliness, from longing. Harry put his palm on Angelica's palm. Angelica didn't remove her hand. Do you want me to help you clean up? She asked affectionately. Then, the policeman rose from his seat and reached for her. So what do we have? Stone walked thoughtfully to the window. Rumors of a werewolf, mutilated corpses, horror on faces. We'll have to wait for the forensics, said Barbara. Autopsy, ballistics, prints. You're right, Stone sighed. But there's one thing that confuses me. 
I noticed that both the door to the house and the gate open outward. Let's say the animal jumped the fence. Let's say the owners were in the house at the time. It's three o'clock in the morning. The village is asleep. So are they? And what does that mean? The beast opened the door and came in without knocking. That doesn't make sense. Barbara twiddled her pencil thoughtfully. It doesn't make sense. Stone agreed. But you know, I can't help feeling that the people there are hiding something. Even Harry, the drunk, the slob. But he's not talking. There's something really going on out there. Harvey, I've done an analysis of the Lunders community survey. Barbara handed a piece of paper to Stone. He took the report and stared at it. Okay, so Nanny claims that some rich guy bought a house that the villagers consider cursed. He came to the village a week ago with some friends. They spent the night here and left early in the morning. Barbara, give me the statement of this parapolit. Here. Barbara held out a questionnaire in her handwriting. Stone looked at it. Right. So, there was some young rich guy in a car that Grandpa had never seen before. Foreign car, probably. So he was with some friends, a guy and a girl. Stayed quiet, slept in the goddamn house, and left quickly in the morning. Interesting. Let's track down this major. Barbara, contact the Bureau of Technical Inventory, find out who owns the house. I'm on it. Barbara picked up the phone. While she was talking, Stone was thinking. Why would a major want a house in the middle of nowhere? Why had he dragged himself and his friends there? What were they doing there? The locals might as well have looked into the house after their visit, if only out of curiosity. Harvey took all the statements from various desks and began to review them. No one said anything more about the house and the visiting majors, although the question of strangers in the village is always obligatory. Okay. What do the locals report about the victims? Selena Walker, 45 years old. Good hostess, great neighbor, not a bad wife. It's all in the same statement. Barry Walker, 46 years old, carpenter, joiner, mason, never turned anyone down. Took little money from people. He ran his own farm. Household, Stone frowned. He couldn't remember any chickens, goats, or other animals in Walker's yard. Not even a dog. Although, a dog on a chain was a must in a house like this. There was a kennel. Varia? Do you remember what buildings were in the walker's yard? Stone turned to the girl who had barely hung up the phone. Criminalists have everything in the inventory, and you didn't let me into the yard. How could I know? The detective sighed. I didn't. He agreed. I didn't want to shock you. You'll see a lot more of this in your lifetime. You'll get there. Oh, come on. Did you get through to the bureau? I did. It's an official request, and you have to be there in person. You can't get that kind of information over the phone. That's understandable. You didn't have to call. Go ahead, make the request, and get it over there. I'll think about it for a while. Here are the forensics results. Feldman handed Stone several sheets of paper. In a nutshell, I can explain the following. Both victims died as a result of being struck in the liver area with a sharp, thin object. The bodies were mutilated after death, but the corpses were mutilated with sharp, curved objects resembling the claws of a wild animal, like a very large wolf. But, in the wounds formed by the touch of these claws were found particles of metal. The analysis of the particles showed that the objects from which, in fact, these particles got into the wounds, that is, the claws, were created artificially. So what you're saying is, someone in the village is pretending to be a werewolf, and he is the killer. And that's the picture that emerges. The major muttered. So the killer went into the house with an awl. More like a thin knife, which is used to stab pigs hinted the expert. Basically, the murder weapon. Then the owner of the house, obviously expecting an attack, shoots at the floor, obviously wanting to frighten the killer, and he succeeds. From surprise the criminal runs out of the house, Walker pursues him, trying to load the gun as he goes. Tip from the expert. We'd also found scattered buckshot outside the house. But he doesn't make it, he dies on the spot. The perk knocked the gun and the buckshot away from him, says Feldman. That's why they were two meters away from the corpse. Then Walker gets stabbed in the liver. Then the perk goes into the house, cuts up the landlady and mutilates the corpse. Say, Mickey, I don't remember any outbuildings in the yard. Chicken coops and stuff. There's a chicken coop in other buildings, but no livestock. Not a thing. Not even a trace. What do you mean? The perk took Walker's entire household. Stone was surprised. It looks like a motive for the crime, but it's unlikely to be all of it. 
That's what the expert said. I think he was in the habit of stealing animals, but the owner ambushed him. We already know how it ended. The paw prints are also disconcerting. Stone said thoughtfully. Artificially set up. So are the claw marks. The killer is inventive, violent, and skillful, said Stone. You'd have to be a blacksmith to make something like this look like this. We'll have to see if there's any in the village. Yeah, I've got a lot of work to do. How about some coffee or tea? Feldman suggested it. And you were and I have cakes. Tea? Stone repeated thoughtfully. Then he realized. No, thank you. I'll be off, Mickey. Thank you. Well, if you find time to visit the old Jew, you're welcome. Feldman smiled. Harvey Stone had one habit he couldn't get rid of. While conducting an investigation, he went into it with his head, thinking about it. That's why at that moment he resembled an autistic person. It was useless to address him, to call him, to treat him. He would go into himself, searching for the truth. And as a rule, he found it quickly. With the appearance of Barbara, who had just graduated from university law school, he became a little easier. Noticing this peculiarity in Harvey, the girl began to cover him, protecting him from annoying and incomprehensible visitors. Soon Barbara realized that Harvey did not get out of her head, but the detective was always so busy that he paid little attention to her. But he always took into account that Barbara was a girl, so he tried to give her intellectual tasks, keeping her away from dangerous assignments. But as a girl he did not pay attention to her, even though he was unmarried. Barbara entered the study, opened the window. It's stuffy in here. She explained, turning to Stone. He remained silent in his own thoughts. Here we go again, the girl said irritably, sitting down at the table. Did you find out who bought that house? Stone asked suddenly. Yes, the owner of that barn is a certain John. I checked it out right away. Do you know who his father is? I do. Alexander. Anala Darch, a major then. We'll have to talk to him. Barbara, I'll leave that to you. But you've got to get the boy to talk. Okay. I'll go to the day's office for authorization and a building inspection at Landers. Take care of yourself, Harvey. Barbara said quietly. What? Oh, yes, of course. Stone left the office. Barbara found outside the car wash. He was standing in line to wash his Mazda CX-9. Barbara walked over to the car and looked at it. The car was new, fresh off the assembly line, but already traveled enough, judging by the dust on the body and dirt on the wheels. Girl, what do you want? John, who was talking to one of the men, approached her. Are you John? Barbara looked at the guy. I eh? Why? John took off his dark glasses. Lieutenant Barbara Soroka. Police. The girl showed her ID. What could the authorities be interested in my person? John wondered. John, I'd like to talk to you. Off the record, do you have a few minutes? Well, if it's off the record, I can. It's just that it's my turn now. Do you mind waiting a little while? I'll bring the car around and I'll be happy to answer your questions in that cafe over there. John gestured to the cafe at the service station. I'm dying for coffee. I'll wait for you, Barbara said. John got into the car and drove it into the garage. Then he got out and started talking to the car wash guy. Barbara walked to the back of the car, took a bag out of her purse and quickly removed a soil sample from the slope, then went back to her seat and put the bag back in her purse. John walked over to Barbara. Is it an expensive sink? Asked Barbara. It's not very expensive. It's a good wash. I recommend it, John replied. The guy's simplicity threw Barbara off balance. She expected the major to be rude and threatened to talk only to a lawyer. John was sympathetic. He was charismatic and had a firm and confident demeanor. Well, in the cafe? He suggested it. Let's go. In the cafe, a waiter came to them immediately. What shall we order? He asked. I'll have a coffee and a brownie, John replied. To the lady, what will you order? He turned to Barbara. I recommend the cakes here. Well, they're delicious, especially with an Americano. I'll just have a coffee, Barbara asked. I understand. Diets, figures. My fiancé also restricts herself from sweets. Although recently, nutritionists have concluded that fatty and flowy foods have a favorable effect on fat deposition. I would argue with that, but I have other questions for you. Barbara grinned. If it's about my friend, I can't help you. I'm waiting to find him myself. Friend? Barbara was a little wary. Oh, 
It's not about Billy, is it? What about him? Did he do something wrong? He left home. John explained. Did you know that? I thought General Biden was all over the place. I heard something, but that's not what I'm talking about. Tell me, did you buy a house in Landers Village? Yes, but it was a legitimate purchase. Why would it attract the attention of the authorities? John wondered. When was the last time you were there? About two weeks ago. Why? I'll explain later. Tony, did you notice anything strange in the village itself? Not really. It's just a village. Although, I remember we were drinking wine in the courtyard with a kebab. A granny came up to us. She was kind of weird. I wanted to buy her a drink, but she refused and told us to leave. She said the place was cursed. It has its own legends. John grinned and shrugged. Some 200-year-old outlaws been running around there. That was all. Then she left. We spent the night and left. I'd like to be clear. Who are we? Barbara asked and sipped her coffee. We're me, my fiancé, Leslie and Billy. Who disappeared? The girl clarified. The one who disappeared. John confirmed and sipped his coffee. You weren't in the village after that? Leslie and I came. About three days ago. Looking for Billy. We thought he'd gone there. But he wasn't there. Tell me, John, just out of curiosity, why do you want a house in a remote village? Barbara asked. Would you tell your father? The boy answered the question with a question. More than that, I don't plan to meet him. Then listen, a house is real estate. And it's very inexpensive. It's only $500. I'm not interested in it as a structure. But the land around it is huge. I have plans to rebuild everything there to ennoble it and you can have a vacation with friends. It's a long way from the city and my parents will never think to look for us there. That's all, John smiled. So what happened? There was a murder at Landers, Barbara reported. Preliminarily, a big wolf mauled two residents right in their house, but I don't think it was a wolf. With these words the girl looked at John carefully, studying his reaction. And she was right of the mark. John's face twitched and changed, but then he pulled himself together and smiled. If it's a wild animal, then what happened could be classified as an accident and then we just need hunters. Are you a lawyer? The girl asked, setting her cup aside. I'm studying. John explained. You're a good student, but this is a murder, not an accident, and the killer is the man who is faking as an animal. You think so? I'm sure. John, I'd like to speak to your fiancé. How would I find her? No problem. John shrugged. Just a second. He pulled out his cell phone and dialed Nastia. Hello, Leslie, hi. He spoke into the phone. There's someone here to see you, to talk to you. From the police, where to come? Home? Now? All right, honey, I'll see you later. He disconnected the connection and looked at his watch, then at Barbara. In about 10 minutes, my car will be finished washing and I'll drive you. Okay, Barbara agreed. Leslie met them on the doorstep of a large red brick cottage. Tea, coffee, she offered. No, thank you. Barbara replied, John. Could you leave us alone for a moment? I'd like to have a private conversation with your fiancé. Oh, yes, of course. I'll be in the car. The guy answered and left. So, Leslie, tell me about your trip to Landers. Your first trip. Barbara clarified, watching the girl. Fear flashed in the girl's eyes, but she held herself in check. We went for a walk. John bought a house there. Showed it to us. We had a picnic, spent the night and went back. That's what the girl said. That's it? Barbara asked. That's it. What happened? John said someone approached you there, Grandma. Hey, yeah, must be the local madwoman. Told us to leave as soon as we could. This place is cursed. That's a bandit who lived in the house 200 years ago. Archie Gomes. That's right, Gomes. He robbed someone that cursed for it, and it's like he can't live or die now. And he kills people. And you believe that? No way. The girl made an effort and smiled. Village tales, local folklore. And then the next morning you left, yes? Of course I did. What's there to stay for? So what happened? A brutal double murder in the village. Did you notice anything else strange? No, the girl gave Barbara a frightened look. We need every little thing, every detail, said Barbara. If you remember anything, call me. Here's my card. Barbara handed the card to Leslie and stood up. Thank you for talking to me, she said. 
Barbara didn't see Stone in the department, so she went straight to the experts. She had submitted a soil sample from the wheel of John's car for examination and was advised to wait a while. I'll have an answer for you shortly, said Rilski. Barbara nodded silently and walked out into the hallway. She didn't like the smell in the lab too much. The girl decided to wait for the results in her office, but on the way she met her former classmate Anthony. Oh, Soroka, hello Barbara. In his usual gruff way, Anthony said hello. How have you been? Still running errands for the famous Detective Stone. Yeah, I'm just going through some papers. Barbara lied for some reason. What about you? We're in the middle of something. A major's missing, the son of a famous singer. My partner, Evan, says it's a hopeless case. Either he comes back on his own or... Hold on. Barbara said. Isn't his name Billy? Billy, Billy. Anthony confirmed it. Do you know something? No, I don't. Barbara laughed. It's just that General Biden's got all the agencies up in arms. Of course he will. Anthony grinned. Not only is he the son of famous people, and that's a scandal. He's also the general's godson. That's a big scandal. If we don't find him, he sighed. There seems to be no corpus delicta, a grown man, 20 years old, left home by himself. And you don't know anything at all? Barbara inquired. Yes, he drove west of the city. Cameras caught the car heading in that direction, and he was gone. The newly minted detective just waved his hands in the air. And the satellite tracking systems. Remember we studied that? Yes, I remember. We just started using them. Lots of procedures. You can't get permission. You can't justify why you need it. You can't do it on your own. Oh, bureaucracy. And the main thing is that General Biden himself demands, himself asks why this, why that, I see. Well, look for it. Good luck. Thank you. Anthony walked down the corridor. Barbara gave him a glance. At that moment, expert Rilski came up to her and handed her a sheet with the results of the examination. The soil is Saudi Pozolik, he said. This soil is definitely from the forest. From the forest? Barbara was surprised. A sudden realization lit up her face with a smile. Thank you, Edward. That was very helpful to the investigation. Barbara literally flew into her office. Throwing her bag on the desk, she quickly turned on her computer. Okay, if we match the fact that Billy's car was traveling west of the city then. Exactly. That's it. Barbara shrieked with joy. Not thinking long, the girl dialed Stone's number. The detective drove into the village and stopped the car at the house of the police officer. Harry met him at the gate. He looked unusual for Stone. Smooth shaven sober, wearing a clean shirt. Harvey marveled for a second at the sudden change in Harry's appearance, then extended his hand. Well, hello, look out Pinkertons, he said cheerfully. Sorry, Major, I don't invite you to the house. Angelica only washed the floors there. The policeman responded to the handshake. Stone was struck by a hunch. Angelica, married? Well, sort of, good for you. Congratulations, now you're a human being. Okay, here it is. I'm here to inspect Citizen John's private property. Here's the authorization from the regional prosecutor. Stone opened the folder. Hold on. The policeman glanced at the document. Inspection of private property takes place in the presence of the owner or a person representing him. Will the owner be there? He will be. In an hour. My assistant already called him and he's on his way here. In the meantime, you find some witnesses and answer a couple questions for me. All the residents' alibis are airtight. Everyone's asleep. Everyone's covering for each other. Where were you at the time of the murder? Harry lowered his head in embarrassment. I was. That's the thing. Drunk? Anyway, I was fast asleep. So there's no one to confirm your innocence? That's how it works. All right then. Tell me, did any outsiders come to the village before the murder? Don't hide anything. You know you'll be protecting the perpetrator. The kids were with a girl. Two guys and a girl, the golden youth, the owner of that house, the cursed one, and his friends. What were they doing? Do I know? Angelica, what was the new owner of the cursed house doing in the village? Angelica came out of the house at his call. Wiping her hands on the hem of an old robe, Angelica answered. Oh, comrade major, hello. Why don't you come in the house? So you wash the floors, replied Stone. You answer in substance, you stupid woman. 
I'm asking you what these young people were doing in the village, where they went, with whom they socialized, or else you're shrieking. Kura, you're the fool. The woman was offended. And what was the first or second time? And they did not come more than once, Stone asked. No. Two times. The first time they came, they cleaned up a bit, went to the store, bought milk and cottage cheese from the locals. Then we roasted meat in our yard. Then we spent the night and left in the morning. And the second time? Late at night, the owner and his girlfriend showed up alone. They didn't go any farther into the house, like they were looking for someone. They talked and left. I got it. Thank you, Angelica, said Stone. Listen, Harry, I need to talk to Nanny's grandfather. I'm right here, man. A sturdy old man of tall stature with a white beard appeared over the fence from the precinct. Come on in, let's talk. Stone went into the clean house and sat down on a stool by the table, obligingly moved by the owner. What do you want to ask me? Nanny sat down at the table opposite the guest. Nanny, you have lived in this village for a long time. Tell me about the cursed house, Stone asked. I've been here since I was born. The grandfather coughed. What's there to tell? Back in the days of Sargorak, Landers was a big village. Two hundred years ago, there lived here a certain Archie Gomes. They say he was a lousy little man. Drank, artied, stole from people. Beat him up a few times, but he got over it. One day he stole something big from a man he was visiting. The man was a bookish man, could do all sorts of things. And he cursed Stark. Said he was dead or alive. Until he gets it back. What about Stark? I didn't take it, that's all. And then disaster struck. The scribe came to Stark at night and started strangling the bastard. And he took up his knife. So he killed the scribe. When he saw that he was a convict, he hanged himself in the cellar. When his mother found out, she died immediately. On the spot, Grandpa shook his index finger in the air. There's howling and moaning from the cursed house, and a beastly growl. But people say that the young men who bought the house have killed the beast. It's quiet there now. And there's a new police officer from the city, Harry. People are afraid of him. He's a tough cookie. Tough, you say? Stone looked out the window and saw a Mazda pulling up. Thanks, Zakharovich. I'll know. Will this help your investigation, son? It will, father. Stone answered loudly, stepping down from the porch. And this time too much thoughtfulness failed Stone. Joan got out of the car at the house, stopped and looked in the direction of a group of people approaching him. As they approached, a tall man in jeans and a jacket, walking ahead of him, extended his hand. Hello, John. I'm Investigator Stone Harvey. This is the local precinct officer, Perry, and these are the witnesses. Hello, Harvey. Jack shook my hand. Well, we've already met the precinct. What I don't understand is, what's there to see? It's a completely empty house. They could have done it without me. The procedure of inspection of private property requires the presence of the owner or a person representing him. Stone answered and looked at the witnesses. Comrade witnesses, now in your presence there will be an inspection of the house and the surrounding area. Please be attentive and memorize everything you see, because you will have to sign the inspection report. Well, lead the way to your property, John. It's the first time I've ever bought a property and it's a hassle. John sighed. It won't take long, I hope. Not long, replied Stone. Then please. John opened the door. The men entered the room. It smelled of dust. The room was completely empty, no table or benches. A small stove stood against the wall. And in the middle of the room, near the open cellar, lay a large mountain of ashes. What had been burnt here? Stone approached the ashes. I don't know. John shrugged. It wasn't here the last time I was here. The precinct wrote something down on the report. Stone sat down near the pile, took a bag out of the folder, picked up the ashes and wrapped them in it. Then he put the bag back in the folder. You guys, I'm taking these ashes for examination, he announced. Grandfather and grandmother nodded silently. Cellar. Open. Stone walked over to the opening and looked down. It was dark down there. Harvey looked at the cellar entrance and looked back. There was a neatly leaning lid against the wall opposite. The detective walked over to it and looked at the fastenings. It looked as if the lid had been torn from its hinges with great force. I'm going downstairs, he announced and pulled out a flashlight. Downstairs the cellar was empty. Damp, fungus on the walls and that was it. A pit like a pit. Suddenly a clump of brown wool caught his eye. 
Stone opened the folder again, took out a new bag and put the wool in it. Putting the bag back in the folder, he closed it and went upstairs. Well, John, the detective turned to the boy. Why don't you tell me off the record what happened here the night you slept here? Nothing. The cellar was closed. There was none of that garbage. He nodded at the ashes. Stone nodded and let the witnesses sign the report. It was empty, wasn't it? Clarified the detective, leaving the house. Absolutely. John confirmed. Danka cleaned up while Leslie and I were buying groceries. There, look in the yard, the remnants of our party. And indeed, next to the table were burnt skewers, plastic utensils, several wine bottles, a bag of ketchup, an empty tube of mayonnaise, and sausage skins. Got it. Stone looked around. There was no point in looking any further. Well, John, I won't keep you. Thank you, and I'm sorry you called. He put his hand out to the guy. It's all right, I understand. Jack shook Stone's hand and headed for the car. Stone gave him a look and pulled out his cell phone. Nanny, give me a hint, for God's sake. John looked pleadingly at his grandfather. You know everything, you know everybody. My grandmother, how to say. She was a short old woman, with a smart scarf, who spoke so wonderfully, like in the old days. Do you remember her? I'm in urgent need of one. What for? Dell gave him a look. She knows something about me. I need her bad. Come on, Nanny. All our grandmothers are like that, Grandpa answered. Tell you what, ask around the yards near your house. Maybe you'll find one. Thanks for the advice. It's very helpful. John ran out of the yard and got in the car. Billy sat by the dugout and watched the water for tea boil in the cauldron. A sudden rustle made him turn around and be wary, but there was no one behind him. Thinking it was an animal, he turned back to the cauldron with relief, but his eyes were fixed on the grandmother in the colored shawl. The boy shuddered in surprise. Don't be afraid, the grandmother said affectionately. It was me who warned you to leave with your company. You see how it turned out. They put Stark to rest, and now you're just like him. Yes? Well, that's all right. Billy rushed to the old lady. He knelt down in front of her. Grandma, I'm begging you, I'm begging you. How do I break the spell? You know how. Help me. Stand up, boy, said the grandmother. It's not right to crawl on your knees in front of people. Stand up. The boy obediently stood up. See how it turned out. Ay, yay, yay. Grandmother clucked her tongue and sighed. The sorcerer's curse has passed on to you. And now you must find and return what Archie stole. Return it to the sorcerer's grave and do a good deed in return. What kind of good deed? Billy asked. You'll see, the old woman fixed her handkerchief. Grandma, tell me, what is this object and where to find it? And where is the sorcerer's grave? Billy pelted the old woman with questions. Wait a minute, honey. Calm down. Making tea? Here's some wee for you. Make some tea and we'll drink it together. I'll tell you everything. There's still time, for now. The old lady sat down next to Billy. Soon the tea was boiling. The wee thrown into the boiling pot gave it a nice golden color. Billy reached into the bag for sugar, but the old woman stopped him. Wait a minute, boy. Don't throw anything extra in. So drink up. What's your name? Billy, my friends call me Dan. Billy, my grandmother's name is Julia. Have some tea, Billy. Have some tea. They'll make you strong and clear-headed. Billy obediently sipped his tea. The tea was nice and sweet, though the boy hadn't put sugar in it. Indeed, his head cleared up, and Billy felt that the drink gave him strength. You boy, listen to me carefully. Two men have been killed in Lander's village, and the murderer is hiding in the woods. They think it's you, because you have great strength and you're hiding in the woods. Tell me this, tell your friend that there's a stolen item in the cellar of Gomez's house, waiting for its time. When he finds the chest, don't let him open it. Put it in the center and say loudly, I return the stolen goods. Do not be angry, man of fire and flame. Take away your curse from the innocent soul. You got it? I got it. Where in the cellar? Do you have to dig? Look in the walls. Well, go and meet your friend. He's on his way. Billy got up and went to the exit of the forest. The old woman was not deceived when Jack's car came along the wide path. His friend got out of the car, stretched a little, waved to him, and opened the trunk. Here, I brought you some food. Milk? cheese, sausage, bread, cereals and potatoes. And this is for tea. And chips. 
you won't go hungry for a few days, then I'll bring you some more if we don't get you back before then. Thanks, Jack. Billy took the bags and put them aside. I gotta talk to you. Me too. Listen to this. Anyway, there's been a double murder in the village. They say a beast got a hold of some people. Have you been out of the woods? No, of course not. Billy looked fearfully at his buddy, remembering his grandmother's words. That's good. I was thinking it was you. I'll tell you what. One more thing. Our grandma's nowhere to be found. Wait a minute, Billy said. If you mean Grandma Julia, we'd already talked. Yes. John was surprised. When do you have time for everything? Bewitched. Unbewitched. I haven't bewitched yet. Billy said guiltily, but there's a chance. Anyway, listen. John changed into overalls, went into the house, and throwing down a pickaxe and a shovel, went straight into the cellar. Oh, I wish we had electricity here, he said, turning on the lantern. The guy immediately began to illuminate the walls, but there was not even a trace that there was something gricked up. Jack began to tap the earthen walls, but there was no result. Soon the flashlight flickered and went out. The battery was dead. Jack groaned, left in total darkness, and reached into his pocket for a lighter. After shining it for himself, he went upstairs, returned to the car, put the flashlight on charge, and rummaged in the glove compartment. There in a bag were two birthday cake candles. He was the one who prepared Leslie's birthday present, ordered the cake, and bought the candles himself. Two numbers, two and zero. The girl's 20th birthday is the day after tomorrow. Right now, those candles would be needed to save a comrade. I'll buy others later. He thought and climbed down again. Both candles illuminated the cellar, where at once it was as clear as day. Jack picked up the pickaxe and looked at it. Oh, uh, I wish I knew how to use this, he thought, and swung it around and struck the earthen wall. The pickaxe went into the ground softly, ripping out a decent chunk. After half an hour of intense work, Jack realized there was nothing in those walls. Fool the old hag, he thought. That's a shame. But the shame wasn't that he had worked for nothing and been cheated, it was that he couldn't help his friend. Jack struggled to get out of the cellar and sat upright on the floor, placing the candle next to him. What the fuck? He thought. There's something fishy going on here. Couldn't have fooled the grandmother just like that. At that moment, he noticed that the candle's flame was just dancing on the wick. Jack looked at the floor. There was a stream of air coming from a gap between the boards. The boy jumped up, grabbed the pickaxe, and hit the crack hard. The pickaxe ripped out a piece of rotten board. Underneath it, the guy saw another board lying across. A few blows on the floor, and Jack saw the opening of another cellar. Jack lay on his stomach and held a candle down, illuminating the cellar. There was a chest there, some things. Jack ran to get a ladder and climbed down. As he shone the candle around, he saw that there was more than just a chest in the cellar. A saber, musket, dagger, and chain mail were hanging on the wall. An old dilapidated zippin and pants hung across the wall. Jack took off the zippin and saw a hollow behind it. In it, like a shelf, was a small carved box with a beautiful pebble on the lid. Jack put the candle closer to it and saw that the box was not just a pebble, but a real ruby. Remembering his words about not opening anything, he grabbed the box and dashed out of the cellar. After a quick change of clothes, he jumped into the car and raced into the woods. Here, here, John handed the box to Billy. He took it, looked at it incredulously, and asked, Is it real? Is it the right one? This must be it, said Jack. All right, go wherever you need to go. I'll wait. Billy turned around and scrambled through the thicket and disappeared through the trees. John grinned and sat down on the hood. Billy walked out to the dugout and froze at a thought. Shit, where is this clearing? Billy wandered through the woods and didn't see any clearing around here. Grandma Julia, he shouted, where are you? Why, child, are you scared? Grandma came out from behind a bush. What's the matter? You become sad. I see your friend has got the chest. Now take it over there. Grandma pointed to Billy's right. There are only trees there. The boy was surprised. You go, said the old woman. She'll bring the chest. Billy went in that direction. His heart was beating with terrible force. It seemed that it was about to jump out of his chest and run ahead of his master. He walked for a long time, but the wall of trees did not block the way, but seemed to grow farther and farther away. 
At last he came to a round clearing surrounded by trees. Billy placed the casket in the center and said the spell he had learned loudly. At the last word, a huge black shadow rose from the ground. It leaned over the boy and he felt a deadly chill. You have returned. Balance. He heard a low whisper in his ear. Now run. Get out of here. Suddenly, the chest beneath his feet fell into the opening earth, and the ground returned to its former state. Billy ran backward without feeling his feet. He came to his senses when he found himself beside Jack. Well, he asked. Now I have to do a good deed, Billy answered. What kind of good deed? Jack asked. I don't know yet. My grandmother didn't tell me. She said you'll see. Is the curse broken? Not yet. I'll fulfill the last condition, and then it'll lift itself. Damn witches. They're so annoying. Okay, I'm out of here. You go do your good deeds and go home. Got it? I'll be back. Jack walked to the car and grabbed the door handle. At that moment, a bus pulled onto the path, locking the road. Men in black uniforms with short automatic rifles began to run out of it. Their faces were covered with masks and helmets were on their heads. Everyone stay where you are. A calm voice sounded. I am Captain Voronin. In case of resistance, you will be fired upon. Let's go, guys. The men in black balaclavas rushed toward John and laid him face down on the ground. The last thing he could shout to his stunned friend was, Dan, run. When John was lifted to his feet, he saw that Billy was gone. He's escaped then. John thought contentedly. He was led to the bus. He didn't resist. He was glad that he was the only one detained. Well, John, you want to talk? Stone sat across from Jack. I'll tell you everything, but you won't believe it. I still can't believe it myself, John answered. Suppose so. Stone sighed. He'd been fighting the urge to smoke for a month now, but his stubbornness and willpower had kept it at bay. Well, tell me your horror story. Would you like some coffee? Barbara pressed the kettle button. If I may, said John. Soon there was a cup of hot coffee in front of him. Anyway, I don't even know how to start, said Jack. It's too weird and confusing. We'll help you untangle it, said Stone. Here's what we got. Your friend Billy is a suspect in an aggravated double homicide. You're covering for your friend. That's also a felony. You understand? You better tell it like it is. Dan's not the killer, I'm telling you. Anyway, I bought a house in Landers. There was a knock at the door and a medium-sized man in a nice suit with a briefcase walked in. Hello, I'm the gentleman's lawyer, Carlo. Why has the interrogation be done without my presence? Carlo, the interrogation hasn't started yet. It's just a conversation. We're sitting here having coffee, said Jack. By the way, would you like some coffee? Barbara, I don't know what her middle name is, made it for me. The lawyer grimaced and sat down in the chair next to John. What is my client accused of? Nobody's accusing me of anything, Carlo. Jack interjected again. You just take it easy. If I need your help, I'll let you know. In the meantime, thank you for your promptness, but I'll take care of it. Are you sure? The lawyer asked. 100%. Assured John and smiled. Well, then, shall I go? The lawyer stood up. Go ahead, authorized John. So, John began as the lawyer left. I just don't want my father to find out about the house at Landers, and the lawyer's gonna start screaming that I'm insane, and I'm perfectly sane. So I bought the house. When John finished his story, there was silence in the office. John, you're misleading the investigation, said Stone. According to you, your friend Billy is a werewolf. He's hiding from humans in the woods until he gets help. He's already getting help, said John. From me, for instance. And I'm sure Dan, I mean Billy, will soon be a normal person again. But you realize that all of this, everything you've told me is unreal. Barbara intervened. Jack grinned. Well, I told you you wouldn't believe me. All right, I can prove what I'm saying. Let's do a little investigative experiment. We'll go to the woods. I'll call Billy. He'll turn into an animal and you'll see for yourself. Yeah, Stone's got a sarcasm. We'll get to the woods. You'll run away and you and your friend will be guerrilla fighters. Yes? All right. Now I'm going to book you in for 72 hours so far. And you sit and think. Maybe you'll remember something. Sarge. A big surgeon appeared on the doorstep. Take the prisoner away. The detective ordered it. Jack was taken away. 
You sounded a bit too plausible, said Barbara. Are you laughing? Do you expect me to believe these tales? Stone was indignant. The villagers told me about the werewolf. Barbara said pitifully. And the expert Feldman says. Stone opened the folder and leafed through the papers. He took out one of them and handed it to the girl. Here, read it. The fatal blows were inflicted with a thin, sharp object. Barbara read aloud. The bodies were mutilated after death, and metal particles of artificial origin were found in the wounds. Here, Stone took the document from the girl. Artificial. Someone's pretending to be a werewolf. And John claims his friend Kudrin is a real werewolf. The young gold diggers are playing with mysticism. They've seen too many horror movies. That's when Harry walked into the office. I'm sorry, I've brought the results of the Ash and Wool forensics. What is it? The detective asked. The ashes are identical to the wool. Besides, there are particles of bone in the ashes. The wool belongs to a wild animal of enormous size. Possibly a wolf or a bear. You're saying a bear burned in the house. Was it in the cellar before that? Stone asked. Yes, and I'm absolutely certain of it. That's what the forensics show. Although I can't say what kind of animal it was. This is nonsense, said the detective. It's not nonsense, Barbara objected. John, that is, John claims that he fought a real werewolf and that it caught fire when the light of the moon, reflected by the silver of the cross, fell on him. Okay, but a huge beast burned in a wooden house and the house doesn't catch fire. There's no fire, not even on the wooden floor. Even though the burning beast is lying on wooden planks. Nonsense. It's not nonsense. The girl attacked again with her arguments. We don't believe in werewolves, but it's real. All right, fine. But John drove a stake through the heart of the beast. He did. Then where's the stake? Why did it burn? If the whole house didn't burn down. Who told you it burned? Did you go through the pile? You took an ash sample from the top. That's it. You're right about that. After a pause, Stone said, I'll call Harry and have him take a look. No, don't. Barbara stopped him. I wouldn't trust a policeman. And you're of the same opinion. Why do you? My gut, I don't like him. He didn't report that golden youths were partying in the village. He's unkempt, unshaven, drunk. There's a button missing from his uniform. Something's wrong with him. That's not why I'm here. What you've listed are facts, that's good, but there are reasons why you don't like him. A hundred thousand bachelors walk around unkempt and unbunned, but they're not murderers. There's another fact. Like what? He has no alibi. No one confirmed that the cop slept home drunk, because he drinks alone. Exactly, but that doesn't make him the killer either. Then who is, if not the drunk cop? I've got an idea, said Stone. The detective arrived in the village late at night, knocked on the window of the police station. Harry looked out, nodded and nodded his head. Stone went into the house and sat down on the stool. I see life is getting better. The detective turned his head around, looking around the room. You bet it is, smirked the policeman. I'm getting married soon. To Angelica. But be quiet. She's asleep. She's had a hard day's work. Why are you so late, Major? It's just a matter of, Stone hesitated. Do you have a blacksmith in your village? A blacksmith? The policeman was surprised. Why do you need one? You see, you can't find a good blacksmith in town. And you're the only one I know from the village. I need to forge a saber. And a scabbard. The chief's birthday is coming up. We want the whole department to congratulate him. But there's no blacksmith. So I thought I'd ask you. Just don't tell anyone. Because we're kind of strict about that right now. Security's gonna grab you by the pants from behind. You can't get away with it. That's right, brother. Do you have a blacksmith? It reminds me of my grandmother when she was a girl. Harry grinned. Kuzma Yegorovich died 20 years ago. But he was a great blacksmith. He forged such things. People even came from the city to visit him. And he left no pupils. There was one. Andrew, my namesake, and a classmate. But Andrew's doing 222. He was only looking at two years. He resisted arrest, grabbed a knife, and even wounded one of ours. But they caught him, didn't let him escape. The judge took into account that it was his first time, his characterization was normal. The chairman of the village council wrote him a characterization. He got three years, so we tried to escape from prison. They added another three, I think. Now he's in jail somewhere, 
No relatives left. Too bad there's no blacksmith. Stone said with annoyance. Well, I'll be on my way. I'll see you around. And look, if strangers appear in the village, report them at once, no matter what they do or how they behave. Check their IDs. Got it? Got it. So long, Major. Stone left the yard and got into the car. After leaving the village, he took out his cell phone and dialed Barbara. Barbara, urgent information. Check on Harry, where he's sitting, how long he's staying, how he's behaving. Bye. The detective's car sped down the night highway, taking him home. The next day, Stone arrived at the station early. He took off his jacket and pulled the Walker case file out of the safe. Flipping through the documents, he pulled out the villager's testimony and began reviewing it again. Barbara came in. Good morning, Harvey, she said, and hanging her purse on the rack, put the kettle on. Here we are. Here, I've written down what I've been told at the Atzathai. When did you get there? Stone was surprised. Who's my daddy? Barbara marveled. The deputy head of the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Yeah, I didn't know. The detective was surprised. Then why are you in homicide and not there, next to your dad? I don't want to protect anyone. I'm interested in solving cases. It doesn't matter. Anyway, I called my dad, and he personally pulled the files and... And what? Stone interrupted her impatiently. Your Pietov escaped from the colony. Barbara blurted out. Stone jumped up. How long ago? Three months ago, said the girl. It matches. It's all in color, said the detective. He picked up the office phone and asked that John be brought to him. John, I apologize to you, said Stone. You're free to go. I don't understand. Did you believe me? Well, not exactly. But I'm willing to be investigated. We can do it right now, shall we? Uh, excuse me. I'd like to go home. I'd like to wash up, change my clothes, eat something. Of course. Will three hours be enough for you? If you get here at 11? No problem. Here's your pass. Barbara handed Jack a piece of paper. John took the paper, nodded slightly to the girl, got up and walked out. Now I'm a little confused, Barbara said. Kudrin's off the hook? No, replied Stone. We have one suspect, and I think he's the killer. Piatov? Of course. Motive is revenge for something. Criminals have this violent revenge thing where they kill the whole family. And where to find him? Same place, I guess, in the woods. He's stealing animals from the locals for food. And then he scares them by dressing up like a werewolf. It's an elaborate concoction, said Barbara. Yeah, Stone agreed. We should comb the woods. We'll see if we can spot a werewolf. A werewolf can only turn at midnight, said Barbara. Wow, that's a lot of insight into the realm of the unclean. Stone marveled. Only Barbara. Ours can turn when it wants to. As John told us yesterday, Billy now contains two entities, the beast and his own. But there's a fear that sooner or later, the beast will push the second essence out and take over. That wouldn't be good, said Barbara. Well, if indeed it is, it might not just be no good, it might be very, very bad. John arrived at 11 o'clock exactly as arranged. When he saw what kind of escort he would have, he was very surprised. Why are there so many people? He asked. They found out who the real murderer was. Barbara whispered, we're going to look for him in the woods at the same time. So at least it's not Billy. No, Billy Stone wants to see Billy. There's no reason to take him. It's not a crime to leave home, especially since he's an adult. Well, if that's the case, I'll join the search, John said. Good, Barbara agreed. Soon the convoy of cars drove out of town. Hello, Harry, there's information that your Piatov has escaped from the colony. I'm sure he's hiding in the woods. Gather all the men, have them prepare their rifles, whoever has one. And wait for me, we'll look for him. No, I'm not alone either, but the more people the better. Come on, wait for me. Stone's out. Well, there we are. Now, Barbara, you're going to have a separate mission. We'll drop you off two meters from the village. After listening to her superior, Barbara nodded. That's it? Yes. Do you think he is? I'm sure. How did you know? Later, the detective answered briefly. I figured it out. Barbara smiled. Billy, your friend here claims you're a werewolf. And I really want to believe him. But werewolves are not a proven scientific fact except in uniform, of course. Why don't you show me how you do it? 
Stone smiled affectionately. Together with Jack, they left their group at the entrance to the forest and went to Billy. Easy, Billy began to pull off his clothes. It's to keep them from tearing. The werewolf's bigger than me, he explained. In a minute the huge beast was towering over the astonished detective. Billy growled and returned to his original form. Well, he asked. Yes, that's all Stone could say. I was shocked too, said John. What are we supposed to do? Billy made the sensible decision to go into the woods before he hurt someone. And I found him and helped him. You don't leave a fellow man in the lurch. Billy, Stone called out to the boy who was getting dressed. He stopped. What? You got a real friend, Billy. I'm jealous. And the detective went to the men. What's up? You ready? Let's chain up and let's go. If you see Piedov, this is a local matter. Take him alive. The main thing is not to confuse him with a policeman, said one man, about 50 years old, or we'll get the wrong guy. People laughed and went forward. Billy, warned of the raid, hid in the dugout. When the men passed, he came out and quietly followed them. Barbara went into the yard, looked in the window. An unsuspecting woman was sawing something. Barbara walked across the yard and looked into the barn. It was a mess. Barbara went inside and looked around old pans, rusty tools, a workbench against the wall. Barbara walked over to the workbench, leaned over and looked down. Under the workbench was a small box, piled on top of it with some iron. The girl began to pull the iron aside, freeing the lid. When she opened it, she gasped. Stone is right, she muttered. The girl walked out of the yard. The woman continued sewing and never noticed her. Barbara pulled out her cell phone. Found it, Harvey? She said excitedly, then I came up with a plan to take him down. I took half the village into the woods so Barbara wouldn't be disturbed. Meanwhile, Barbara quietly found his murder weapon. She called me back. Convinced I was right, I called the false Harry by his real name and he was caught. And the next thing you know, what's he gotta get? Capital punishment. Life. Double murder with aggravating circumstances is no joke. Anyway, get well. Too bad, Billy said. Too bad for who, Pavtov? The detective was surprised. No, that you didn't kill him in the clearing, said Billy, and his eyes flashed wildly. Stone, Barbara, John, Leslie and Billy left the courthouse with a feeling of deep satisfaction. Pavtov had received the capital punishment of life imprisonment. Well, our epic is over, John sighed. And thank God, Leslie shrugged. Stone and Barbara wisely remained silent, for they knew that new mysteries and new cases awaited them. Such is the life and work of detectives. The men were walking in a chain, and no one paid any attention to Stone, who was talking on the telephone. Harry walked briskly, glancing around glumly. Why so glum, policeman? Stone asked him cheerfully. I don't feel like walking through the woods for some fallen thing, he answered. Well, if we catch him, I'll beat his face in. I wonder how you'll do that. Stone said suddenly. Harry looked at him, and there was a wild fury in his eyes. You think I won't? I've never seen a man in my life who could punch himself in the face, Piatov. Piatov who? Are you confused? I'm Harry. No, you're Piatov. The men stopped abruptly and surrounded them in a ring. I wonder where I've seen you, said one of them. You've grown old in the zone, bitch. They didn't recognize you right away. The second one spat. What's wrong with you guys? Harry looked around at the crowd. You got it wrong. It's Harry. Here's my ID. He slapped his breast pocket and abruptly pulled a pistol from the shoulder holster. He shot at one of the men, but missed, and dashed through the bushes. Stop. One of the men shouted and raised his gun. Don't shoot, shouted Stone and rushed after Piatov. Stone stopped in a perfectly round clearing. He froze at what he saw. Piatov stood with his pistol in front of the grinning werewolf. The beast snarled and showed huge fangs. On its mighty torso hung ragged clothes. Apparently Billy had not had time to undress this time. Piatov raised his pistol and fired, but he did not do the beast any harm. He fired again and again until he ran out of ammunition. In one leap the werewolf grabbed him with its paw and threw him to the ground. Growling furiously at him, Billy grabbed the killer by the collar and lifted him above him again. Coming up close to the day's stone, the werewolf tossed Piatov in front of the detective. Stone silently pulled his hands back and snapped on the handcuffs. 
That's it, Billy. Thanks for your help with the investigation. He lifted the killer to his feet and took him by the scruff of the neck. Pietha wanted to say something, but the werewolf wriggled its neck, brought its huge, ugly face closer to him, and growled. Stone was disgusted to see a puddle spreading on the bottom of the criminal's pants. That's it, Billy. That's enough, he shouted. The beast turned into a guy. Stone dragged Petrov to the men's house, where they had to wrestle him from the village lynch mob. Why did you kill Barry, asshole? A big man with a beard spat in the bandit's face. Guys, the investigation will sort it out. That's our job. I'll tell you all about it later. Stone was literally dragging the frantic killer, but the crowd wouldn't stop. Murderer, one of them took a chance. Other epithets are not common in decent society. The riot police took Pietov away. Billy felt weak and his legs shaking. The last thing he heard was John's voice. Billy, what's the matter with you? Guys, he's hurt. There's a lot of holes. Ambulance? Put a jacket under his head. Stone's voice seemed far away. Squeeze here. We gotta stop the bleeding. They put rags over the guy's wounds and he passed out. Well, Billy, you did a good deed. An old lady's voice came over the boy's ear. And you've done me another good deed. For 200 years I've been suffering until my son's sin was forgiven. And you gave back to the sorcerer what he stole from me. So what was in the box? Billy asked. A book of spells. Answered Grandma Julia. Goodbye now. The curse is lifted from you. God bless. Billy opened his eyes. A room. A single room. Stay down, Billy, stay down. He heard a woman's voice. Mom? Victoria was sitting by the owl's bedside. She had to send her husband alone on a tour. She had to stay with her son. You scared us, Billy. Mama cried. Mom, Billy whispered. It was the highest reward for him to finally know that his mother loved him, her son, not money, fame, and touring. After a few days, he was allowed to get up. And then he let mom go on her errands, but they let John in. Look, they didn't let me see you for a week. He complained, putting the food he brought on the table by the bed. What's new? Billy asked. Saw Stone. Said you're getting a medal. Uncle Mickey did his best. All right, what about that asshole? He confessed to everything. Well, Stone can tell you all about it later. Doctor says you're on demand. I got news too. Anyway, I've started construction on my house in Landers. And not just my house. I've decided to start a business there. An agro-industrial holding company, Vaden. What kind of name is that? Billy was surprised. It's short for Jack and Dan. John explained. You're in on it. Anyway, here's the idea. We're gonna completely rebuild the whole village. Houses, lights, internet. We fix the roads, that's a must. We build farms, a livestock farm. Cows, bulls, pigs. We'll plow the fields, plant a lot of things. There's land, well, you've seen for yourself. Plenty of ideas in short. So get well, and I'll be on my way. John shook his friend's hand and disappeared out the door. But Billy wasn't bored for long. Soon Stone came to see him. What's up, hero? He said cheerfully. I brought you some news. General Biden himself is gonna give you a medal when you get well. So what's the deal with this murderer? Billy asked. Yeah. Well, the story's a bit of a twist. But we got it untangled. Yeah. Stone was quiet for a while, and then he went on. There was this gunfighter, just a country boy. Never liked to work since he was a kid. He was a lazy bum. And it so happened that he was orphaned. Orphaned early. So the local blacksmith decided to teach him his trade. He taught him, even adopted him. And then he died. Whether he died of his own accord or whether Andrew helped him, it's not clear. So Andrew took up the hammer. I guess he became a man. He worked till noon, fulfilling orders, and in the afternoon he began to forge knives. And not just knives, but weapons of war. Barry Walker noticed that the boy was tough and could make things with his hands. He suggested that you forge the iron and I'll carve the handles. Galia will be mine to sell. And the proceeds in good conscience, half for you and half for Galia and me. Believe the guy. Started making. And the business went on. But he found out that Barry didn't give him all the money. They tell Alyosha about one price, but they themselves sell more expensive. And the guy got angry. He called Barry out of the house and said that now he would sell him knives at his own price and let him set the price for himself as he wished. 
Barry didn't like the offer. He sort of agreed, but in fact, he turned Andrew in to the police. They came, ordered a battleground dagger. And when the guy made it, he went to jail. He got this animal rage in him. He took the dagger and slipped it to one of the cops. He didn't get away, they caught him. But when he was questioned, the investigator told him who had ratted him out. And Andrew held a grudge. He tried to run, but they caught him and gave him a jail sentence. Oh, he cursed himself for getting caught, so he came up with a plan for revenge. He worked in the prison forge and forged iron gloves and overshoes with animal paw prints. Barbara found them in his shed. It's an interesting design. Gloves like normal work gloves, but with the forged claw on top. And there's a long all coming out of the right one. Anyway, he escaped after all. He found a specialist who gave him a fake ID and an assignment to Landers for money. Time passed, he settled down in his native village. The locals didn't recognize him, his face lost weight, and Alexei became more mature. That's when he started stealing animals and spreading rumors about the werewolf. But the werewolf was actually sitting in your house in the cellar. The one that bit you. Anyway, he frightened the villagers. That's when one of the local hunters recognized him. But Pieto twisted, blurred his eyes with his ID, and sent the hunter to John's house. Well, he was still a state trooper then. The hunter didn't come back, which is what Piatov wanted. So the hunter's brother went to the house and died too. The werewolf ate them completely. There was no one else to recognize Piatov. Old people have bad eyesight. Yes, that's a police officer and fuck him. No, that's fine. And there are no young people in the village. Piatov relaxed, started drinking. Then he asked Angelica to marry him. It seems like he's getting smart. So how did you know he was the killer? I could smell a shapeshifter a mile away. Stone smiled, but there was another fact. He said he'd been living in Landers since he was a kid. And Nanny's grandfather once told me that the precinct commuter. I let it slip at first, but then I remembered and compared the two. I stopped by at night and asked him about the blacksmith. Well, he told me the whole story. About himself. Only he thought I believed he was Harry. But that's when I got suspicious. Thank you for watching this video to the end. Subscribe to the channel. Like it, write comments if you like the story. And see you on the channel.